This morning, if it's okay, I want to start with a bit of a history lesson. And it's interesting because we're looking at the early Christian church going back 2,000 years. And one of the things you see as you read the book of Acts is that whenever there is the proclamation of Jesus, there is also persecution or difficulty. Proclamation, persecution, proclamation, persecution. It's a theme throughout the whole book. In fact, I have a quiz for you. When you look at the early Christian church, the 12 disciples, can you guess how many died for following Jesus? You don't have a guess? It's 11. It's 11. Except for John, who is exiled to an island. I'm not sure if that's any better. Um, but 11 died for following Jesus. I remember going up inside the church, and we had a lot of symbols around our church growing up. And one of the symbols I saw growing up was this one for James. Um, I'll bring it up here now. It was a saw. And as a young boy, I'm like, James must be like extra cool dude. Like it reminded me of like the Iron Man competitions of those strongest men when they're like, you know, trying to saw the hunk in their display of power, right? Or like, you know, maybe that's James. He's like lumberjack, apostle, extra manly, and that's why he's got the saw, right? Now, you might know where I'm going. Does anyone know why he's the saw? Because he was sawed in two. His symbol is that because that's how he died. And we look at that course of all the disciples, and, and so we have a lot who died because of their faith. It reminds me of what was happening in, in the Roman rule at the time. We had the Emperor Nero, and one of the ancient wonders of the world is the Colosseum, which is where uh, Christians were the gladiators, where Christians were persecuted for following Jesus. They'd fight to the death for entertainment because of their faith in Jesus. One of the crazier stories about Nero is that he'd throw garden parties and as lamps for those parties were, were Christians who were burning alive. That's crazy. I look at those stories and I try to relate to my life here, and there's not a whole lot of connection. <laughs> Following Jesus, thank God, is not life-threatening in this country. Following Jesus here may lead to um, maybe being made fun of or different persecutions, but it's not life-threatening. That isn't the case for others across the world. In fact, if you want an interesting website, persecution.org will follow some very hard journeys in, in order to follow Jesus. In fact, if you're following the news, have you heard the story of this man? It's uh, Pastor Saeed Abedini. Anyone hear of him? He is a 33-year-old pastor. His family lives in Boise, Idaho. He has two, two uh, children. And he's right now in Iran, one of the most brutal prisons in the world. The reason he is there is because his family's from Iran. And while he was visiting his family, he started to, to preach about Jesus and organize the, the Christian church there, and because of that, thrown into prison. Currently, his situation's horrible. He'll get beaten. He'll be in the worst circumstances without hospitalization. His attorneys say that right now he has internal bleeding, but they won't treat him. They won't take him to a hospital. He just has to suffer through this. You might have heard the name because his wife is working to put this in the forefront of everyone's attention and, and, and try to get him out and resolve this. Now, when we look at the saw, when we look at what he's going through being separated from his family, would any of us have the audacity to call that sweet? Would any of us have the audacity to say, oh, that's a good thing. He sure is blessed for what he's going through. There is a group of people who looked at the sacrifices for following Jesus and called it blessed, and it was the early Christian church, dear friends. That's who we get to learn from today. Now, if you're new to, to Christianity today, if this is your first time in church, we welcome you. We're so glad that you are here. And today might be the day where you look into following Jesus and you just think it's crazy. <laughs> and if so, we, we say we're, if we're out of our mind, it's for the sake of Christ. If you're a Christian today and you're considering what this all means, I think there's a silver lining of hope. That for anything we might sacrifice, for anything we might endure for the name of Jesus, there is a silver lining of praise and hope and goodness. So welcome once again. But first we need to get our bearings. Because there are different reasons that we can suffer. Uh, let, let me give you examples. Uh, reasons for suffering. One might be that I sinned and so I suffer. Let's say I have a BFF who told me a secret. She really liked the, he really liked the girl or something. And then I let that secret out on my BFF. That BFF is no longer my BFF, and the reason being because I had loose lips. Now, I'm suffering because of that, but that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the sweet suffering that we're talking about. It's not about sinning and then suffering. Another reason you can suffer, you can suffer by living in a sinful world. <laughs> Part of what we go through may be our body. You might have a backache, 
or you might get sick, or you might face adversity because this world is broken. That also is not what we're talking about. God is good. He can get us through those situations, but that's not the sweet suffering we're talking about. What we're talking about is that when we were serving God directly, uh, trying to follow him, that is what is considered sweet. The sacrifices, the sufferings, exactly for trying to do God's will. Or at least that's what the early Christian church thought, as we hear from our lesson. Let's get into it. Let's see what they endured and see their reaction from Acts chapter 5. Uh, we read in the middle of page 7, invite you to follow along. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. This is the second time they were brought to a court, and they were threatened by death to stop preaching the name of Jesus. <laughs> we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all the followers are scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Well, his sweet speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in, and they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, rejoicing, because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. That is an incredible story. The apostles who are threatened by death who are beaten within an inch of their life, rejoice to have encountered worthy of suffering for the name. That's what we get to talk about. May God so bless this discussion today. Um, you know, as we get into it, I want to talk a little bit about roller coasters. Um, I, I, I know that in uh, Six Flags Great America, they have Goliath coming out. Kind of cool, kind of cool. Any roller coaster fans? I know I've shared this, but I am not so good on roller coasters. Um, in fact, I don't go to Six Flags. I can't handle any of them. I got sick on the Wizard. It's awful. It's just an awful, awful thing. Um, but I do go to Disney World. I remember going to Disney, and Disney World's roller coasters are a little bit more tame. And, and they had a new one coming out, and uh, I won't share the name because I don't want to wreck it for you, but uh, built up by the newness, I wanted to go on. I wanted to experience it. But I should have considered what I was signing up for before I went. I get on the roller coaster and uh, everything is done well. That's Disney. The storyline, the ride is pretty good. And all the while, my body is saying, you know, this is okay, but you're pushing it. And I'm thinking, I'm going to make it through this ride and have a blast and it's going to be great. Until, until I get to this. Now at this point, I, I recognize that the railings have fallen off. And so I'm like, are we going to go, like, is there a, a, a drop down, a bottom? A, what's going to happen next? Well, does anyone know what happens next? You go backwards. Now, I did not sign up for going backwards, and neither did my stomach. <laughs> and my stomach let me know that. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. And so I'm here to tell you, you need to know what you're signing up for. If I knew I was signing up to go backwards, I would have not gotten on. That's the same with following Jesus. I don't know what your perception is of what it's like to follow him. A lot of it is good. In fact, it's a very blessed life. He is here to give you a marvelous peace and joy that transcends everything. He is here to give you direction on, on how to treat people, on what to do with your money, on, 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 on your relationships, on so many things. 
But I'm here to tell you that it is not a life of ease. I'm here to tell you it is a life of peril, and it can be very, very difficult. You might not lose your lunch, though you may. You could even lose your life. And Jesus was up front with that. Consider these words. Jesus said to his disciples, The student is not above the teacher. You and I who follow Jesus, we're, we're not going to be treated too much differently than him, nor a servant above his master. If the head of the household was called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his house? Jesus was persecuted, betrayed, made fun of. And so he says, you want to follow me? Get ready. You're going to be made fun of. Get ready. You're going to be mistreated. Get ready. It may not go well or easy for you. And that's what the apostles experienced. This is their second time before the rulers who are threatening upon death. Stop talking of Jesus. That's extreme. Kind of reminds me of what some pastors can go through in serving Jesus. I'll never forget the story of one of my friends who was really being persecuted quite harshly for proclaiming Jesus' name and being a pastor for, for no other reason, basically. And, and, and the way he was persecuted was through the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web. And, and there was a site almost dedicated to tearing down his name um, you know, just slander and gossip all over the place and tearing down his ministry as he tried to tell people about Jesus the Savior. It weighed on him. In, in fact, another pastor, I, I believe, um, got it right. He said, you're not doing your job as a pastor uh, unless someone is blogging hate about you or calling your church a cult. <laughs> that was his litmus test if you're doing the job right. Another pastor had to say that for every Christian convert can rise up a critic of the faith. A convert, a critic. And it reminds me kind of physics. Any science guys in here? Science ladies? Anyone enjoy science? Anyone know the, the third uh, rule of Newton's laws of motion? Third rule of Newton's. I'm going to read some of it. Let's see if you can fill in the blank. I, I got it here. It says that for every action there is an equal and... Nice. You guys are smart. And it so struck me that this is sometimes how the church of God works. I have uh, Pastor Bloomer's third rule of church motion. Are you ready for it? Uh, here it is. It is, for every kingdom advance, there is an equal and opposite kingdom attack. In, in fact, I live in a world where my wife and I sometimes will just call them straight out the devil's attacks. The devil's attacks. And, and have you ever been in this situation? I know I have where it couldn't be any other explanation than demonic activity the way things went down. Right? Like, you couldn't have planned it worse if you wanted to. Right? I mean, you know, it's a cloudy day and the people get in your way and they make fun of you and then you get an email that's horrible and then, and then all of that is just, yep, he's trying to mess me up. I see it. Right? And that is what's going to happen on a regular basis if you want to follow Jesus. I'm here to tell you clearly you will face opposition and persecution in your following of Jesus. That's not a if, it's a when, it is a guarantee. So what are we to do, Church of God? Reminds me of the phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get... Yeah. And I think we get going sometimes in a different sense. Going not in like sticking in and working harder, but we get going, we want to quit. That's how I want to get going. In our church body, there are a lot of call days going on of teachers and pastors who are being sent out to be these public ministers on a regular basis. Uh, never forget my experience. And before I went, I had my pro and con list. And I remember one thing on my con list was that it's going to be harder to follow Jesus in this occupation. It's going to be more intense, and I'm going to be a bigger bullseye for the devil. And there was a temptation to say, I don't know, I maybe should do something else. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you've had this experience that when God is pushing you towards something, and God's will is pushing you towards something, and your temptation is to push away. Maybe you've had this experience where following Jesus maybe just got too intense, and so maybe we should just cool the afterburners. We've got to take a season off for a bit. Maybe it's a bit more momentary. Maybe it's in our lives where we, we see what would be the easy thing to do, 
But the right thing to do is more complicated, complex, and there are things standing in the way. Dear friends, we're all tempted to give in. We're all tempted to throw it away. We're all tempted to quit at times, but I'm here to say, turn from that. Turn from it, my friends. There's a better way. Don't give in when the going gets tough. For let's look again at the story of Jesus. What's the essence of the story of Jesus? I'm going to break it down real simply. Jesus had to face opposition to save the world. In fact, when I was considering the gospel, I kind of considered it as a commander sending his soldiers, so the Heavenly Father sending his son. And the Heavenly Father says to his son, You know, son, I'm sending you into a sinful, sordid mess. It isn't pretty. The son says, Yep, I'm ready. The father says, You know what, son? <laughs> They're not going to like you. Most people will hate you. Your best friends will desert you. Your family won't even believe in you. Jesus says, yep, I got this. Heavenly Father says, you know what, it's going to mean pain. This is the worst possible way to die. Jesus says, yeah, but with you with me, I can get through anything. Heavenly Father, about that. I'm going to leave you as you bear the curse for sin. And Jesus says, oh yeah. But this was the plan from the beginning, wasn't it? Because we love him. Yeah, we do. Jesus' love is so amazing that facing all that opposition and knowing it, he goes into it because he loved you and he loved me. And he's content to bear a cross. He's content to be forsaken by the Father. The reason suffering is sweet, my friends, because it is the source of our salvation. It's our leader who went first for us so that you and I could gather today with victory knowing we're forgiven, we're at peace, and we have an unequaled, unwavering, unfailing, amazing love for us. So we don't have to run from sweet suffering. We can embrace it if our Jesus did. And this is what I love about Jesus, dear friends. He sees a barrier, and he doesn't rethink the barrier. He doesn't pause and say, well, I wonder if I should do the barrier. He breaks through the barrier. Jesus, who saw the barrier of the Pharisees and says, I'm going to break through that. Jesus saw the barrier of the temptation of the devil and says, I'm going to break through that. Jesus saw the barrier of the cross and I'm going to break through that. Jesus, who saw the barrier of the grave, and said, I break through that. And we stand here today with the same power available to us. In fact, I want to make a deal with you. I want to make a trade with you. Let us trade God all of the complication, all the mess, all the difficulty. Let's give it over to Him today. From our heart and say, this is hard. And let us now claim the power available to us. The power that says, by the grace of God, if you rose from the dead, you can get me through this. By the grace of God, if you rose me from the dead, you, you can get me the power to go through this. Breaking any barrier down. That's Jesus' power. And that's what makes all this sweet, if we can know that power at work inside of us. It is amazing to me that as I look at this lesson, as we turn to it and consider this sweetness. There is a man who didn't even believe in Jesus that he raised from the dead, and yet he believed in the power of God. I love Gamaliel in the lesson and his speech. He stood up and he said, you guys, let's look at it again. Verse 38 and 39. He said, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. And he'd already cited some history reasons. It was a time where we know in church history, Judas the Galilean tried to lead a revolt against the Romans. It didn't go well, they all died. And so he says, if it's like that, it'll fail. But, verse 39, if it is from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. Here's what I believe. God's power can make you unstoppable for him. 
The power that raised Jesus from the dead can be at work in you and I to follow him in any and every situation. For I have no other explanation but God's power for why the disciples did what they did. Verse 40, what happens to him? Verse 40, it says, His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Flogging. Anyone here see the Passion of the Christ? Mostly we remember the flogging, don't we? <laughs> and flogging is, is really, it could take people's lives. You're literally beaten within an inch of your life. It had a whip and the cat of nine tails and it had glass and shards. When I was reading the Greek, the, the Greek literally meant to skin someone. And these people who were just flogged, beaten within an inch of their lives, do what in verse 42? Don't miss the incredible notion in this. Verse 42, it says, But day after day in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You flog me? Ain't no thing. I'm going to continue on preaching and proclaiming what I know to do, that Jesus died and rose again. Dear friends, that's the power of God. To talk more about how this might work in our own lives, I want to tell you an old preacher's story. It's a preacher's story about a donkey who fell in a well. Anyone hear this one? A donkey who fell in a well. There he is. Now when the farmer found his donkey who fell in the well, the farmer said, well, this is it. I need to close up the well anyway, and I guess I have to say goodbye to my donkey. So he called his friends together, and they got their shovels, and they started throwing dirt on the donkey to close up the well and get the donkey down somewhere where I'm going. Well, as that dirt was thrown on the donkey, it's amazing what the donkey would do. Every time the dirt was on its back, he'd shake it off, and then he'd stand on the dirt. The farmer and his friends would throw more dirt. Donkey do the same. He'd shake it off, stand on the dirt. He'd shake it off, and he'd stand on the dirt. After a while, the farmer noticed this donkey was rising out of the well because he shook it off, and he started standing on the dirt. Do you see where I'm going? I'm not sure what you're facing right now to follow Jesus. I'm not sure the naysayers in your life, they can be in your family at work, I'm not sure if it's dating and someone doesn't understand. I'm not sure if it's in a marriage and you're trying to do it well. I'm not sure if it's your kids. 